Our next speaker is Dr Colin Tringrove from ProAg Consulting. Colin is a lecturer in ruminant health and production at the School of Animal and Veterinary Sciences at Roseworthy, uh, part of the University of Adelaide. He also runs a consulting business, ProAg Consulting, that includes facilitating lifetime new management groups and seminars on various livestock topics. A career interest in ruminant nutrition and health over 42 years spans employment in primary industries, mixed veterinary practice, livestock consultancy and academia. Current research projects include the impact of micro and trace element nutrition on lamb and steer growth, factors impacting lamb loss and the influence of water quality on livestock performance. Colin's talk today will talk about the application of technology to animal health. Over to you, Colin. Thank you, Graham, and uh, thank you to Sheep Connect for the opportunity to speak to you here today. Always good to get back to the southeast. I spent half my uh, working career, or almost half of it, I haven't finished yet, uh, down here, based at Narracourt, and also do quite a bit of work around Panola. So uh, lovely to see, get back here and see the country in such good heart. So uh, the th way I thought I'd atta attack this uh, animal health technology, uh, I thought firstly talking about what's current, what's uh, emerging and what's uh, blue sky or future. And I must admit when I uh, put the talk together, I thought, well, there's a lot of current stuff, not much emerging and not much blue sky. But uh, I see that what we can do, we can do a lot of things a lot better than what we currently do with the technology we have. And certainly uh, the display out here will give you a much more idea of, um, I guess, the emerging and the future as well. So I've decided to attack this as a uh, sheep management calendar. So working through the year, uh, and so the topics I've picked on there are really issues that you would address during the year. So firstly, uh, starting off with uh, the annual management calendar. So as we see, we have the, uh, the dry feed disappearing over the summer autumn period. We go through the autumn break, we have a bit of a cold spill and then the uh, spring flush, which seems to have flushed more than most this last spring across Australia. And then of course, any surplus we uh, turn off, we take off for fodder conservation for supplementary feeding. But really what I wanted to focus on here was the uh, feed on offer, so the y-axis. And uh, so how many people here have done uh, lifetime ewe management? Bit of a rough idea, so probably about a third. Uh, and so you'd be well familiar with this, that um, ultimately the objective there is to match the uh, feed on offer with uh, livestock demands. And uh, the idea of optimising your uh, profitability, as uh, Chris gave you a very good discussion with this morning. And uh, we really aim to keep sheep in that condition score three. So not the, uh, the fours and fives, the, the pretty looking ones that uh, Nathan referred to. But uh, to be productive, we really want to have that animal in score three, ideally turning out as many lambs as possible uh, on an annual basis. So I started off here by talking a bit about feed-based monitoring. And uh, MLA have uh, partnered with Sea Valley Labs to talk about, or pastures from space. I remember going to a seminar in Keith in 1990, uh, talking about the new pastures from space. So the satellite imagery, satellites passing over um, every paddock twice a week, depending on cloud cover, giving you good images of how much feed is on offer in the paddock and the various ground proofing or uh, calibrating that went on with that. But it's taken a long time to really get to something that's uh, probably commercially viable. So uh, this iteration uh, now with Ciba Labs, I see is going that direction. So what we're seeing here is that uh, your particular property, for example, broken up into the various paddocks and you can see how much feed's on offer uh, and how much uh, ground cover is there. So ultimately what we're looking to do is assess the, uh, the rolling monthly pasture biomass or food on offer as we refer to it. And, uh, and so instead of you going around with your pasture stick or your snips and, and quadrant or your pasture meter, you're about to basically sit in your office now and decide how much feed you've got in the paddock and how many uh, animal you're going to be, be able to run for how long. It's not quite that simple, but that's the idea. Uh, and so you can see trends in pasture growth uh, and ground cover. And because this data has already been collected for five years, you're about to look retrospectively. Uh, if you subscribe to this service, you're about to see retrospectively how much feed you've had in your paddocks over the last five years. Uh, and so ultimately, it's what we're aiming to do with lifetime ewe management. We're matching the uh, feed on offer in the paddock with how many livestock you can run. And, and obviously we're trying to aim at optimum stocking rates so you can optimise your productivity or your profitability. So enabling more accurate feed budgeting. So of course, if that doesn't work out, and so we've had many years where uh, com uh, 
confinement feeding has become uh, almost the norm in uh, certainly in the mid and upper north and uh, air peninsula where uh, basically you're allowing for that um, feed mass to uh, or maintaining a ground cover through summer autumn and then maintaining uh, sufficient feed mass before you actually turn them out into the paddock. So that's been a very profitable exercise in terms of um, economically because you reduce the energy needs by the livestock by not having to roam around your paddocks. And, uh, and so providing you've got uh, grain at the right price and, uh, and hay at the right price, that uh, can be a quite a, an efficient way to run. Ultimately, we're trying to coincide your lambing with your feed on offer. So if we talk about the, um, the feed on offer, or well, the energy in the paddock is a combination of obviously what the animal can eat each day and then the quality of the feed that's on offer. So we can graph uh, the energy in the paddock and then we can correspond that with the energy needs of your ewe and uh, the late pregnant ewe and then the uh, lactating ewe. So the red line here is really representing the energy needs. From uh, lambing onwards, the uh, energy needs go up two or three times. And uh, so we want this gap between what's in the paddock and what the animal needs to be as narrow as possible. So this is just simulating essentially what would be happening in, in this sort of environment. And uh, so we minimise the need for supplementary feeding uh, and we're utilising the feed in the paddock. So the, if, we, uh, if you do a sort of quick rough calculation, you work out it probably costs you about two cents a kilo to produce dry matter, whereas it will probably cost you 10 or 15 cents or even 20 cents to a uh, kilo if you're buying that feed in. So it's far better to grow as much feed as you can and harvest it efficiently, obviously, but maintaining ground cover to ensure your, uh, your soil uh, your soils are looked after. So the plan is to ideally lamb down when you've got green feed on offer. And, uh, and so that doesn't always work. Uh, and certainly this year was a tough year for uh, certainly further north where we didn't actually get a lot of rain. But uh, in most years, if you're lambing somewhere around about sort of June, July, you should have feed on offer so that the ewes can maintain optimum lactation so they can support their twin lambs. And, and not to mention actually having the lambs in conditions in inadequate fat cover for when they're born. So that all comes down to having the ewes in good condition. And score three, 3.3 3 is what we aim for. So uh, the key to uh, matching feed demand and feed supply is uh, getting that time of lambing right. And so we really want to minimise the cost of supplementary feeding and optimise the use of feed in the paddock. So depending on what your system is, if you're trying to uh, grain finish lambs, you might be lambing them down when you've got about four or five months of green feed on offer. If you're producing store lambs, you might be aiming to produce lambs, uh, lamb them down about four months prior to the uh, green feed turning off. Or if you're retaining them for future use, uh, you might be looking more at lambing down when you've got three months of green feed ahead of you. Uh, and so that's reasonably predictable. It's not always predictable when you're going to get green feed, but you should at least know from your, your environment as to when it's going to turn off. Okay, so next on the management calendar, talking about joining. And uh, so many of you will have seen this graph, and I just in, slotted in there these days with a lot of people with their shedding sheep, which we know are polyesterous. In other words, they'll tend to breed all year round. Uh, that's the plan anyway, they don't always do. But uh, so if we've got... Um, uh, wool sheep, we're talking about uh, their seasonality in terms of they not being polyesterous, they're seasonal breeders, and all sheep basically are uh, optimum cycling behaviour uh, at the autumn equinox in the, um, towards the or 21st of March. So if we look at the oestrus cycle, so we normally say that uh, sheep cycle about every 17 to 20 days. So in, or in order to uh, get most mated, you should be able to get... Um, most ewes joined at least 95 plus percent joined in two cycles, so five or six weeks. And in fact, two thirds, if you've got your rams firing real ones and your ewes are in good condition uh, and they're cycling, you should be able to get two thirds of your ewes joined on that first cycle, that first 17 to 20 days. Uh, and that's uh, using one and a half percent rams, one and a half, two percent most. The, uh, so typically we will see somewhere around about 70 to 150 percent lambing in merinos and uh, as Nathan pointed out you can get certainly some producers getting well above that uh, with your uh, crossbreds and uh, composite breeds. So we try not to join our wool sheep uh, between July and uh, November so we say don't, uh, don't join during Jason uh, and the reason being is that most ewes are not cycling in that period. Having said that I only 
caught up with um, one of our consultants the other day who's now based in New South Wales who's um, joining his Merino use uh, three times over two years and getting very good results. So how is he achieving that? Well, you can join out of season uh, if you use teasers. So when the ewes are not, not many ewes are normally psyching. Traditionally, as the day length uh, shortens from the, um, uh, the longest day, which is about the 21st of December. So thereafter, the uh, day length starts to shorten. That switches the uh, melatonin on uh, to stimulate the uh, animals into cycling behaviour. But if you introduce um, either weathers that have pepped up with um, testosterone, uh, as Nathan said, not many people have test uh, weathers these days, so uh, it might be vasectomised rams. And uh, you put them out there for a fortnight prior to your in intended joining period. That stimulates the ewes to come into cycling behaviour. That You take them out, put the rams in, and away they go. Now, uh, a lot of people these days are also using Regulin. So Regulin is actually, uh, and some, in fact, some people use it too, not to stimulate uh, estrus, estrus behaviour or sexual um, being turned on, but more to do with it actually encourages good sleep behaviour. So people take melatonin these days if you're a bit of a restless sleeper, and especially if you're doing the long haul flight to the US or whatever. So uh, Regulin, melatonin, uh, so it's a naturally occurring hormone, but what you're doing here is you, by giving it to the rams and the ewes, you're stimulating them into uh, estrus behaviour. So that's uh, been proven to be quite effective and certainly uh, Hamish Dixon, the consultant I was talking about, he's using regular on a, on a regular basis to get his three lambings in two years. And then there's also Overstim, which is another uh, product that was around back in the 70s uh, and for, called Fecundin. Uh, one of the problems was well, it, it actually multiple, causes multiple ovulation, so you end up with a lot of lambs. Uh, and at the time, if you've got merinos, for example, that may be more than you want. But if you've got um, crossbreds, composite breeds or maternal um, breeds, uh, it can be quite an advantage. So it stimulates uh, more ovulation, so you'll end up with more lambs. So that's another strategy, but you really need to have a very good system in place uh, to introduce that as a management tool. Otherwise, you'll, uh, you'll have a, um, potentially a lot of dead lambs. Okay, so moving on from mating through to shearing. Uh, now, I don't have a lot to report here, uh, so the old traditional method, uh, notice here I've got a, a blue sky dot and a, um, and a familiar green dot. So we talk about uh, what's happening there, so actually some of the research we're doing at Roseworthy is uh, we've identified uh, amino acids in corn, uh, corn protein, which if you feed it to sheep for three days, it will cause a break in their fleece. So this is a, uh, shall we say, a, a biologically friendly way of uh, causing a defleecing. And uh, the only trick now is we're trying to work out a, an appropriate method of harvesting that fleece without um, uh, losing it in the paddock, I suppose. And also you don't want to take the fleece off straight after you've had a break in the wool because then you'll end up with some burnt sheep. So um, AWI have just sub sub submitted some more funding towards that research. So I'll put that there as blue sky because it's probably still going to be a few years off because the engineers have got to work out how to have a sort of rubber fingers, I suppose. So the sheep walks through and it pulls all the fleece off as it goes through. Um, some of you would be familiar with the sheep nets we used in the past. That system sort of uh, didn't s stack up economically, uh, but um, that's still being researched. The other thing, uh, talking to Emily King, the National Extension Officer for the AWI yesterday, so what they're focusing on currently, they've actually put kinetic um, me measures on, sh on shearers, and worked out where uh, most of the strain and pain is occurring, and it's usually actually catching and dragging them out of the um, dragging pen uh, is where they cause most of the muscle injury. And so now they've actually, uh, it's already well established, Haynes Engineering, for example, are, have contracted to provide um, uh, the catching pen, elevated catching pen, uh, so that you actually just reach in, grab the sheep and pull it out, a bit like the gun crutch here. It used to be, those who are familiar with that. So it's actually just a single um, race behind the catching pens, elevator pens, so you just reach forward, pull the sheep out. So it takes a lot of that strain out and shearers are now reporting they can actually do 10 to 15% more sheep in a day because of that, uh, eliminating that strain. So that's uh, a one little innovation that's on the, on the market now. Okay, so moving on to uh, scanning. So uh, this looks like old tech, not new tech in this case. Um, so this is me scanning sheep about 25 years ago at Rat and Bully. Uh, but I'll put that in there. Uh, this is obviously a lot flasher technology these days, although the, the image is still the same. You've got the lamb sitting here, the head and the abdomen. 
but uh, I was charging 60 cents to do a twin uh, pregnancy back in 25 years ago uh, when lambs were probably worth $60. Now they're worth $300 and I think preg scanners are charging 80 cents a head to do twins. So the economics have never been better to do scanning and yet there's still a large number of sheep producers who don't use this technology. And uh, I see it as it's critical to a cost-effective feed allocation. So we talk about optimising the utilising the feed that you've got in the paddock. You really want to put the best quality and most available feed to your twin bearers or your or triplet bearers. There's uh, any number of um, scanning services around uh, in the uh, southeast these days. I can uh, see one in the back, back row there. And uh, so... There's no shortage of people to do the job and I just see it's, a, it's an essential strategy that you need to be using to optimise lambing and weaning percentages, which is really where a lot of the um, MLA funding and industry funding is going these days is all about improving our lamb survival, uh, lambing numbers and then lamb survival. Okay, so moving on to lambing, I don't really have much to report here in terms of technology, just the fact that... Um, getting back to that point before, that we really need to coincide our lambing with the uh, green feed on offer. Uh, and so shifting that uh, might be only shifting the lambing forward a month or two uh, can make all the difference in terms of the, uh, the net profit at the end of the day uh, because you're spending less on supplementary feed and you're utilising the feed you grow better. Uh, and there's a few projections there about what climate change is going to do. I won't go into that. Um, but suffice to say um, that... Uh, matching your lambing with the uh, green feed season is still the critical factor. Then we can move on to lamb marking. Now, what, what has changed in lamb marking? Well, it's still the same story. We're still aiming to do it around about six to eight weeks of age. Uh, we have the vaccination against various diseases, EID, which um, uh, Nathan's just talked about. Uh, but we have, uh, the, I guess, the imperative now to use pain relief. So in the past, and... Uh, even with mulesing, having been brought up on a sheep property myself in the mid-north, um, you just accept that mulesing was a standard practice and didn't think too much about it. But now we know that the uh, consumer is that much more aware of uh, perhaps what's happening on farm and our need to be uh, showing best practice So in terms of using pain relief. So I guess that's the big change that's happened in recent times. Uh, and uh, the other issue is just um, correct vaccination technique. So, actually, um, anyone spot what's uh, wrong with that photo in terms of the vaccination technique? It's, a pro it's a more of an OH&S issue. So, uh, these days, I'll probably, I'd, I should have actually put in a vaccine gun, but these days there's a one-handed operation where you don't actually have the other hand near it. Too many people stab themselves. And when it comes to Yoni's vaccine, the good air vaccine, where you can end up with um, blisters rupturing up, rupturing out down your leg or up down your arm, uh, because of the vaccine going in and following your muscle fibres along, causing a lot of disfigurement and a lot of uh, surgery, really you need to be very careful about doing your, your vaccine technique. So really you shouldn't have that hand there even though it is protected. Uh, the other critical thing is that you should only use a quarter inch needle at any time because all vaccines are effectively subcutaneous, just under the skin, you're not going into the muscle. And there's a, a condition now recognised in the eastern states called good air staggers, good air being the Yoni's vaccine. Uh, because people use too long a needle and they're doing it in the right spot just behind the ear, but the trouble is they stab it into the spinal cord using a half inch or three quarter inch needle and that lamb will develop a spinal abscess in another couple of weeks time and start doing cartwheels and backflips uh, and obviously with dire consequences. So uh, people who have made that mistake so many times just from using uh, too long a needle. So quarter inch needles, all you need to just pierce through the skin and one action uh, usually with a protected needle to minimise the risk. So uh, avoiding carcass damage. And uh, so this is usually done four to six weeks of age, uh, repeated later, just like you did with your COVID vaccine, that you'd need to have a, um, a primary dose, then a booster four to six weeks later, and then potentially an annual, or sometimes even uh, more frequent boosters, depending on circumstance. So in years like this one, where you've got lots of good tucker available, lots of medics, lots of uh, legumes uh, and lots of lush feed, it really uh, puts the pressure on uh, causing sheep to roll over, eat, especially ones that eat a lot. Uh, they're more susceptible to your clostridial diseases. So we recommend that you should be vaccinating every three months if you're putting the sheep into those high-risk situations. And, of course, you can include your um, trace elements if um, 
if your area is seen to be deficient uh, and only you will know that. So the vaccines on the market, nothing's really changed. We've got the, uh, the, the Vive in one. We now recommend that you use the gland vac because the, uh, we want to eliminate cheesy gland as best we can from the industry. Uh, costs the industry millions of dollars each year, those um, abscesses, which are really only picked up at slaughter. And it was interesting that um, Nathan mentioned about um, feedback. So now uh, we're very close to having the um, oh, what, it was, um, livestock linkage, what was it called? Um, forgetting the name now. But anyway, we were, we're getting that feedback um, live. So you can actually virtually follow your sheep through the slaughter now. Uh, LDL, that's right. But it's, it's actually just, they've just called, changed the name. <laughs> but they've got the uh, livestock data link. So you can actually virtually follow your sheep along the slaughter line without actually being in the uh, abattoir. But the other issue is they are actually pairing uh, animal health data with that. So you actually, you'll get a complete feedback of all the carcass measurements on your sheep at slaughter, but also the animal health issues. So as Nathan referred to, you know, if you've got a cheesy gland in the elbow, the shoulder gets cut off. If you've got a cheesy gland in the lungs, the whole rib cage gets cut out. Uh, and so you'll get that feedback about the incidence of the various diseases. I know you've been getting feedback um, from TFI for the last, since 2007, about 20 different conditions, uh, but now it will actually be allocated per carcass. So how, much, how many had dog bites, how many had bruising, how many had grass seed issues, how many had uh, parasite burdens, etc. So that's um, just on the cusp of uh, being available. The, um, and so arthritis is a significant cause of condemnation for lambs, especially at, at slaughter. And in fact, I uh, implore that you should all follow some of your lamb lines, or for that matter, adult sheep lines through the abattoirs to really give you an appreciation of what goes on. Uh, and I think it's always an eye opener. It gives you a great insight into some of the animal health issues that you might be experiencing. We've had Aerivac um, available for treating arthritis. Uh, for quite a number of years uh, and now they have combined the 5-in-1 uh, cheesy gland with Aerivac to have gland airy so you can uh, treat arthritis as well as your other clostridial diseases. But um, I guess that's only relevant if erysipelas is the cause of your arthritis and there are half a dozen different causes of arthritis so you really need to establish is that uh, going to solve your problem or it may be uh, uh, unrelated. I needn't say much about identification, so the old and new systems there, as you know, the uh, EID is uh, basically becoming available as of, well, it's already available to those who want to use it, but it will become compulsory or mandatory by 2025 nationally. Uh, so the Victorians jumped us on that one. They've had it available for about five years, uh, but now we can benefit from their experience in terms of uh, how we implement that. So you'll be you would have hopefully seen access to a survey recently. There's, um, there's a EID uh, sheep and goat traceability subcommittee of Livestock SA, which are surve surveying uh, producers' opinions about EID. Uh, so if you get an opportunity, please contribute to that. Tail docking, uh, nothing new there except uh, using pain relief, but the, uh, the old three palpable joint issue seems to be still well and truly overlooked, especially with prime lambs. A lot of people just love to chop it off at joint one because uh, they have a nice round back end when they go to slaughter. But uh, the advantages of uh, chopping it off at that third joint uh, are many. So we have a, a much smaller area there to heal. So you increase the speed of wound healing. Uh, the leaving the tail long enables the, so when the animal does uh, defecate or urinate, it can lift the tail, elevate the uh, skin and the wool away from that area so you don't get urine and, uh, and faecal staining. So uh, that reduces the, um, the risk of fly strike. Also, leaving it the three joints long covers the tip of the vulva so we don't get vulval cancer, which can be a significant issue in some areas. It also reduces the risk of rectal prolapse. So if you cut the tail too short, you risk damaging the spinal cord uh, and subsequently those animals can rectal, have rectal prolapse. And especially in feedlots, a uh, number of uh, feedlot owners will say, oh, look, I just won't buy lambs from Joe Bloggs anymore because I know that his lambs have a high incidence of rectal prolapse because he cuts his lambs, his tails too short. So it is actually a, quite a recognised syndrome, that. And the, uh, the other one related back here to increased wound healing, 
uh, a survey done by Joan Lloyd, a, a veterinary pathologist at TFI some years ago now. She followed 60,000 lambs through the abattoirs uh, and found that um, there was 50% less arthritis in those lambs that actually had the correct tail length. So cut off at uh, joint three instead of joint one. And the reason being, once again, if you're cutting the tail off back up here, it takes longer to heal and there's more opportunity for bugs to get in and set up arthritis. So it's a, it's a given that um, correct tail length is, is a very important strategy, but still not well un understood. Okay, so uh, I did a number of trials last year using uh, numb nuts. And, uh, and so this is uh, one of the properties I was doing the, uh, the study on, looking at, um, with, I had students with me, we were doing observations on, on the efficacy of it. So we just see here, it's just a simple technique of injecting local anaesthetic um, in at the base of the purse when you've made sure you've got the uh, two testicles in the, in the scrotum. Uh, and the same here, the, uh, sometimes they react a bit if you uh, hit the bone instead of the uh, joint. But uh, the critical thing there is we're putting local anaesthetic right where the ring is going. Uh, and that basically numbs the uh, area for a few hours. It's really only uh, so that whilst uh, it's a local anaesthetic used, uh, which the numb nuts uh, crowd have now called pneumocaine. Sorry, pneumocaine as opposed to lignocaine. Uh, and it's about works out about 80 cents a head, up to a dollar if you've got if you're doing uh, castration as well, or should I say rings as well as uh, tail. Um, and that lasts a couple of hours, but probably more importantly, if you're using meloxicam, uh, which is uh, a long-acting uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, uh, same as I use on my knees, um, the, uh, that lasts about three days, one, one injection. So you're getting the short-term benefit from the local anaesthetic, but you're getting a, a long-term benefit. So the animal is more likely to mother up and, uh, and carry on as usual without uh, feeling that uh, pain. Interesting, we had a, a livestock advisor update yesterday uh, up at Hundorf and uh, one of the professors from Adelaide Uni is doing a lot of work on human pain, but using animal models. Uh, and he's found that by look, dissecting the brain, uh, you can see where the animals have actually had some trauma in their past. And so you can actually see changes in the brain as a result of being castrated, mulesed, uh, tail docked. Uh, and so it's actually using that information now to work out how we can do much better pain control in humans. But it's a really interesting study that you can actually see, it's an imprinted on the brain as soon as you've actually caused animals severe pain, that it's um, there, for, there is a, a map for a lifetime. So uh, this looks a bit like old technology. Uh, essentially, it's probably the same as what goes on in your property. But I just wanted to highlight here that uh, uh, the, what we're doing here is uh, this particular producer is no longer uh, musing. They, uh, he's using a hot knife and he's actually doing a bit of a tail trim to uh, overcome that uh, excess uh, dung accumulation around the tail. And uh, so, and breeding uh, using genetics so that they have a relatively uh, bare breach. And so they've got away from that musing issue. And now combined with the use of pain relief, uh, they are getting that premium for uh, uh, basically using the, the, I guess, the uh, best practice strategy. So, uh, and then the other issue here is uh, basically just putting a bit of uh, trisulfan uh, on the, uh, on the wound afterwards. The, obviously, mulesing is not occurring here, but uh, and a bit of fly protection at the same time. So mulesing, uh, whilst it's uh, something that we, as a sheep industry, intended to outlaw in, by 2010, uh, as a result of Peter's um, uh, strong uh, criticism of the uh, technique, unfortunately, we never got there. Uh, lots of techniques, uh, AWI spent millions trying to come up with a better option. Uh, and there's still um, research in that area to try and uh, basically ab ablate or obliterate the uh, hair follicles around the, um, the breech area rather than having to do this um, sort of, I guess, what we'd now consider probably barbaric uh, technique of uh, str stripping flesh off. But um, at least if you are musing, uh, you should be using trisulfan. Uh, and I think surveys indicate that over 50% of industry are using trisulfan. So that's a combination of a local, two local anaesthetics, a short and long acting one, a disinfectant and adrenaline to reduce the, uh, the blood uh, flow 
Uh, so there's that aspect. And then, of course, if you're in the fly season, you're also going to be putting a fly dressing around the fleece, not over the wound. You don't want to wash the tristolpin off. Uh, and you should be using uh, this Medicam, so the uh, long-acting uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory to give pain relief for the next three days. There's also buccal jesic, which is one you can squirt in the mouth as opposed to this is a, um, an injection uh, under the skin. Uh, and so there is a uh, MLA fact sheet which gives you all the different options, um, so highlighting the different strategies you might use. So the illustration I just showed here, using the hot iron uh, docking, castration, uh, but not with mulesing, but uh, we see here that um, using meloxicam plus trisulfan is the preferred um, method, or you may be using Medicam and uh, Numacane as we referred to. And uh, there's lots of easy handling devices these days. So, for example, this gun you can pick up online for about 20 bucks um, using that short quarter-inch needle. Uh, you put your 100 mil meloxicam bottle in there, uh, and so you can just give a half mil dose uh, to each uh, lamb as you're doing them. So it's not as if it's uh, an exacting task. Okay, so moving on to uh, weaning, uh, then we're drenching. Uh, and then we might be doing some follow-up worm egg counts uh, to decide whether drenches are required. So nothing too much new here. Uh, it's really just a case. I think there's a lot of people who could do it a lot better. And uh, so using faecal egg counts to decide if a drench is required. There's a lot of people, a lot of sheep get drenched unnecessarily, which has contributed to drench resistance uh, and, uh, and, probably, and so consequently ineffective worm control. Uh, and then there's... Uh, Machines on offer now which you can actually just plug the dungs into the machine uh, or slurry them up, put them in the machine and that will spit out a, uh, an illustration of what the uh, worm egg count is. So it actually fluoresces the eggs. So the little circles here show the fluorescent eggs on the screen of the uh, computer. So just the software does the counting for you. Um, in the past, uh, you know, a lot of people have done it manually which takes about 20 minutes per mob whereas this, uh, this will do it a lot quicker uh, and at less cost. But the other issue is just monitoring pasture contamination. If you're doing regular worm egg counts, you can work out how many uh, worm larvae you're depositing on each paddock. Uh, and so you can selectively decide which paddocks you're going to retain for your weaners or your at-risk animals, which may be your late pregnant ewes. So you're not putting them into a paddock and loading them up with worms straight away. So you're strategically rotational grazing around paddocks where you've monitored the, uh, the, the uh, worm contamination. Ultimately, we're just trying to minimise that drenching, mainly because we want to preserve the chemicals we've got. The more you use the chemicals, the more resistance we develop. And there's uh, more information you could ever dream of on the Parabos uh, site, uh, which gives you a lot of strategic information about worm control. So strategic use of drench, uh, Nathan referred to um, like these guns are calibrated uh, so that um, when the sheep goes into the uh, holder, holder, the handler, uh, it gives a body weight calculates what drench on the gun and so you just can give it to the animal so they're getting a strategic dose. And this particular producer in a lifetime year group I run up at Parowa, um, she said she saved $250 the first run of drenching she did because of the not using uh, drench unnecessarily. Traditionally we always say weigh your three heaviest sheep in the mob and drench accordingly to that heaviest body weight. Now this is strategically dosed according to what the animal weighs. So, uh, but it doesn't come, uh, or it comes at a significant cost. I see there's a display of the particular device out there, so you can ask about it. Uh, so what we're aiming to do, we're wanting to uh, strategically limit the use of chemicals, use grazing management, uh, and the third point here is selectively breeding. So using ASBVs. Once again, ASBVs have been around for a number of years, but a lot of people don't use them. Obviously, uh, all this data collection from the, uh, basically from the sheep being evaluated, through to the sire and dam, half brothers and sisters, uh, looking at environmental management groups, heritability, etc., uh, all feeds in to come up with a, a genetic correlation or, or genetic value for that animal's um, innate qualities. So we can measure them at various ages uh, and we can look at numerous traits. This is just a sample of some. So we can look at um, you know, the heritability as it affects weight, carcass, fertility, fleece, and what I'm focused on here is the parasite resistance. So, for example, uh, it would be the PWEC, which is the uh, post-weaning worm egg count. And uh, so 
how do we look at ASBVs? So these were set in 1990. We said, OK, every, every animal is uh, zero at that point in time. Uh, and we then each year we compare to the, the current, within the current group, but relative to what it was in 1990. So it can be positive or negative. Uh, and so, for example, if we can look at worm resistance. So this illustration here, we know that um, resistance to worms in sheep is, uh, has a heritability, a moderate heritability, 25%. Uh, and so if we uh, buy a ram with an ASBV of minus 20 for the um, post-weaning worm egg count, uh, and uh, if the person's, if the stud owner or the ram breeder has been doing it for a number of years, you can get pretty good accuracy. If we compare it to, uh, say, another ram, ram B, which has got a, an ASBV of zero, uh, we know that the uh, ram that you've bought passes on half the genes to his progeny, and of course the, the ewe passes the other half on. So the progeny will actually be 10% better than the ram with a zero um, ASBV. They'll be 10% more resistant to worms. If you do that, Repeatedly over years, you can reduce the worm contamination in your flock by 50%. So this illustration here, if you look at how many infective larvae are on the pasture in the middle of winter, if you just randomly uh, breed, uh, of course, you'll have 100% um, pasture infectivity on the pasture. If you select rams with worm resistance, you can reduce the uh, number of infective larvae on the pasture by 50%. If you don't do any drenching, of course, you're going to have a lot of infective, past, uh, infective pasture. If you drench, you might reduce it by 20%. So it just highlights that using ASBVs, uh, selecting for rams with a low worm risk, uh, is the most efficient way to go. And this is work that was done by the sheep CRC 25 years ago up at Armadale. OK, so um, optimal worm control. Don't buy in someone else's problem. Make sure you... Uh, drench those sheep with a number of different actives to uh, minimise the risk of bringing in any drench re resistant worms. Monitor your worm egg counts regularly, late winter, spring, pre-lambing. Drench only if necessary. Uh, for example, weaners usually do need a drench. Uh, prepare paddocks, uh, low worm risk paddocks for the most vulnerable ones. Only use short acting drenches in and out of the system in 12, 24 hours. Drench capsules, and a lot of people have used them as a prop for a number of years. Uh, they've been taken off the market by the manufacturers because they knew they could foresee the resistance issue emerging. So it was no longer cost effective for them to um, keep producing them. Uh, and then there's a, other techniques. If you've got healthy looking fat sheep like Nathan was referring to, they probably don't have worms and so don't drench them. There's no point in drenching an animal that doesn't have a problem. Uh, using ASBVs and all the information you could need is actually on the Worm Boss website. Okay, so then coming along to um, culling time. Now, essentially, Nathan addressed this, so I won't spend much time on it, but just to highlight the fact that um, you, uh, age is not necessarily a good reason to get rid of animals because they can be highly productive. Uh, lameness can be certainly an issue. There's been a lot of that around this year, a lot of foot abscess and foot rot. Um, and uh, looking at udder confirmation, that can be a really good reason to cull animals. A lot of people keep dud udders, uh, expecting to rear, rear two lambs. And of course, uh, if they've only got one teat or they've got mastitis, they're not going to do that. Has the animal bred in the past? Has it been dry? Uh, what's their current condition? If they're below average for condition score and they've been in a sea of plenty, there must be an issue. Right, okay, so jetting, nothing new there, but uh, typically we really want to minimise the use of uh, chemicals but uh, sometimes it's essential that you do, um, do a jetting technique to minimise uh, the lice issues, depending on circumstance, or, or it could be flies. And uh, then we go on to crutching. So a number of reasons why we crutch, uh, because obviously flies is, a, is an ongoing issue. And uh, so there's all these strategies that we currently use to control flies, whether it's crutching, uh, tailing at the right length, using uh, jetting as needed, breeding for bear breach, internal parasite control and musing as we've talked about. You can do a, um, a fly risk simulator, a fly boss is on the Paraboss website. Uh, so this is typically mapping out your fly risk, uh, for example, in this area, if you don't do anything. If you do a spring crutch, you can knock that fly risk down, you know, perhaps by 50%, but you're still gonna have a fly issue. Uh, whereas if you're using a crutching combined with a chemical application and then shearing in autumn, 
uh, you can effectively almost eliminate flies as a problem. But I know a lot of people have been chasing flies uh, this spring because of the uh, favourable conditions. Uh, and so there's um, a lot of information on the uh, Flyboss website under the Paraboss banner, which you can find out more detail. Lastly, um, following up, just you should be keeping really good records. And uh, I think Nathan's uh, presentation made you aware of that, utilising EID effectively. So you want to be monitoring um, you know, weight gains, wool production, deaths, and certainly uh, Chris referred to that as well. And uh, then looking, identifying risk areas and what you might need to address, uh, looking at your breeding programs, perhaps tightening up the joining period as uh, we referred to earlier. And then it's imperative that you do keep a record of all your treatments uh, with the electronic vendor declaration, sheep health declaration, which is uh, basically mandatory in South Australia, but uh, not many people seem to realise that. Uh, so you should be providing all this sort of data when you're actually selling sheep and certainly being aware of the fact that um, there are rehandling intervals. For example, if you've treated your sheep with diazinon, no one should handle those sheep for 42 days because it is a human health risk. And so there's lots of really good programs out there that you can use on your mobile phone uh, to keep a record of all those details. So the um, key message, uh, best practice involves monitoring minimal chemical use to achieve major gains and it comes at a, a minimal cost. Thank you.